every body. Today we'll have multiple choice questions exam for medical students. Doctors undergraduate and postgraduate. Nurses. Hope you get benefits. But before we start, please like, share our videos, subscribe to our YouTube channel number one doctor. Follow us on social media accounts in description below the video. In each question you will have four choice. You have to choose one correct answer. Then explain why you choose it it. Are you ready? Yes, I am ready. What are the ABCs of the primary survey? Assess stability of patient begin treatment cervical spine don't forget to stabilize the cervical spine B airway breathing circulation. See accident history, background, patients past medical history, community, family medical history, D assess, begin, to treat, complete, evaluation of all injuries. The correct answer is, B. The first step in patient management is performing the primary survey, the goal of which is to identify and treat conditions that constitute an immediate threat to life. The ATLS course refers to the primary survey as assessment of the abscess airway with cervical spine protection, breathing, and circulation. Although the concepts within the primary survey are presented in a sequential fashion, in reality they often proceed simultaneously. Life-threatening injuries must be identified and treated before advancing to the secondary survey. Which of the following would mandate elective intubation in a patient with a normal voice, normal oxygen saturation, and no respiratory distress. A airway bleeding. B stab wound to the neck with mild swelling in the left lateral neck. C localized right lateral subcutaneous emphysema. D bilateral mandibular fracture. The correct answer is A. In general, patients who are conscious, do not show tachypnea, and have a normal voice do not require early attention to the airway. Exceptions are patients with penetrating injuries to the neck and an expanding hematoma, evidence of chemical or thermal injury to the mouth, nares, or hyperpharynx, extensive subcutaneous air in the neck, complex maxillofacial trauma, or airway bleeding. Although these patients may initially have a satisfactory airway, it may become obstructed if soft tissue swelling, hematoma formation, or edema progresses. In these cases, elective intubation should be performed before evidence of airway compromise. Patients with stab wounds to the neck do not necessarily require elective intubation, nor do patients with localized subcutaneous emphysema. Bilateral mandibular fracture without airway compromise does not require intubation. What is the most common indication for intubation in a trauma patient? Altered mental status. B. Inhalation injury. C. Facial injury. D. Cervical hematoma. The correct answer is A. Establishment of a definitive airway i.e. Endotracheal intubation is indicated in patients with apnea, inability to protect the airway due to altered mental status, impending airway compromise due to inhalation injury, hematoma, facial bleeding, soft tissue swelling, or aspiration, and inability to maintain oxygenation. Altered mental status is the most common indication for intubation. Agitation or obtundation, often attributed to intoxication or drug use, may actually be due to hypoxia. Which of the following trauma patients with airway compromise and failed endotracheal intubation should undergo emergency tracheostomy, rather than a crocothyroidotomy? A. An 84-year-old male with blunt trauma to the neck. B. A. 65-year-old female with a stab wound to the submandibular region. C. A. 16-year-old male with a gunshot wound to the neck. D. A. 6-year-old female with a crush injury to the face. The correct answer is D. In patients under the age of 8, Cricothyroidotomy is contraindicated due to the risk of subglottic stenosis, and tracheostomy should be performed. Emergent tracheostomy is indicated in patients with laryngotracheal separation or laryngeal fractures, in whom cricothyroidotomy may cause further damage or result in complete loss of the airway. This procedure is best performed in the OR where there is optimal lighting and availability of more equipment, e.g., sternal saw. In these cases, often after a clothesline injury, Direct visualization and instrumentation of the trachea usually is done through the traumatic anterior neck defect or after a collar skin incision. Cricothyroidotomy is performed through a generous vertical incision, with sharp division of the subcutaneous tissues and strap muscles. Visualization may be improved by having an assistant retract laterally on the neck incision using Army Navy retractors. The cricothyroid membrane is verified by digital palpation through the space into the airway. The airway may be stabilized before incision of the membrane using a tracheostomy hook. The hook should be placed under the thyroid cartilage to elevate the airway. 
A6.0 tracheostomy tube, maximum diameter in adults, is then advanced through the cricothyroid opening and sutured into place. Which of the following is the most appropriate initial treatment of a sucking chest wound? Occlusive dressing taped on three out of four sides. B chest tube placed through the wound, cover wound, and chest tube, with occlusive dressing. C chest tube placed in a clear area, closure of the wound. D closure of the wound, intubation of the patient, sedation. The correct answer is A. An open pneumothorax or sucking chest wound occurs with full thickness loss of the chest wall, permitting free communication between the pleural space and the atmosphere. This compromises ventilation due to equilibration of atmospheric and pleural pressures, which prevents lung inflation and alveolar ventilation, and results in hypoxia and hypercarbia. Complete occlusion of the chest wall defect without a tube thoracostomy may convert an open pneumothorax to a tension pneumothorax. Temporary management of this injury includes covering the wound with an occlusive dressing that is taped on three sides. This acts as a flutter valve, permitting effective ventilation on inspiration while allowing accumulated air to escape from the pleural space on the untaped side, so that a tension pneumothorax is prevented. Definitive treatment requires closure of the chest wall defect and tube thoracostomy remote from the wound. Placing the chest tube through the wound would increase infectious complications and would result in inadequate closure and healing of the wound. Closing the wound with a remotely placed chest tube is the definitive treatment, which is usually done in the operating room, rather than as initial treatment in the ED. Closing the wound without a chest tube could result in a tension pneumothorax and is contraindicated. A four-year-old is brought hypotensive to the ED after an MVA. Peripheral IV access is attempted but is unsuccessful. The next best access is a cordis introducer in the internal jugular vein, B single lumen subclavian venous catheter, C double lumen femoral venous catheter, D intraosseous catheter. The correct answer is D. In hypovolemic patients under 6 years of age, an intraosseous needle can be placed in the proximal tibia preferred or distal femur of an unfractured extremity. Flow through the needle should be continuous and does not require pressure. All medications administered IV may be administered in a similar dosage intraosseously. Although safe for emergent use, the needle should be removed once alternative access is established to prevent osteomyelitis. A cordis introducer would be excessively large for even central veins in a four-year-old child. Both the single and double lumen catheters would be less effective than the interosseous for resuscitation. According to Poisil's law, the flow of liquid through a tube is proportional to the diameter and inversely proportional to the length, therefore, venous lines for volume resuscitation should be short with a large diameter. Which of the following is a life-threatening compromise to circulation and must be identified during the primary survey? A unstable pelvic fracture. B. Pericardial effusion. C. 40% pneumothorax. D. Femoral artery injury. The correct answer is A. During the circulation section of the primary survey, four life-threatening injuries that must be identified are massive hemothorax, B. Cardiac tamponade, C. Massive hemiperitoneum, and D. Mechanically unstable pelvic fractures. A pericardial effusion without tamponade is not immediately life-threatening, nor is a pneumothorax or a peripheral arterial injury. Which of the following is defined as a massive hemothorax? A. 1,600 milliliters of intrathoracic blood in a 100-kilogram woman. B. 900 meters of intrathoracic blood in a 70-kilogram man. C. 800 milliliters of intrathoracic blood in a 50-kilogram woman. D. 200 milliliters of intrathoracic blood in a 20-kilogram boy. The correct answer is A. A massive hemothorax is defined as greater than 1,500 milliliters of blood or, in the pediatric population, one-third of the patient's blood volume in the pleural space. Which of the following is the best initial treatment for acute traumatic pericardial tamponade in a patient with a systolic blood pressure of 90 millimeters of mercury? Immediate or thoracotomy with pericardiotomy and repair of the injury. B. Or thoracoscopy for pericardial drainage. C. Fluid resuscitation to stabilize blood pressure during transfer to the operating room for definitive repair. D. Ultrasound guided placement of a pericardial catheter. The correct answer is D. Early in the course of tamponade, blood pressure and cardiac output will transiently improve with fluid administration. In patients with any hemodynamic disturbance, a pericardial drain is placed using ultrasound guidance. Removing as little as 15 to 20 milliliters of blood will often temporarily stabilize the patient's hemodynamic status, 
prevent subendocardial ischemia and associated lethal arrhythmias, and allow transport to the OR for stenotomy. Pericardiosynthesis is successful in decompressing tamponade in approximately 80% of cases. The majority of failures are due to the presence of clotted blood within the pericardium. Patients with a SPP less than 70 mm of mercury warrant emergency department thoracotomy EDT, with opening of the pericardium to address the injury. Thoracoscopy is not considered a reasonable treatment for traumatic chest wounds with hypotension. This patient does not warrant an earth thoracotomy because the systolic BP is greater than 70 mm of mercury. The best initial treatment is ultrasound guided placement of a pericardial catheter followed by transfer to the operating room for definite treatment. Removing as little as 15 to 20 ml of blood will often temporarily stabilize the patient's hemodynamic status, prevent subendocardial ischemia and associated lethal arrhythmias, and allow transport to the OR for stenotomy. Pericardiosynthesis is successful in decompressing tamponade in approximately 80% of cases. The majority of failures are due to the presence of clotted blood within the pericardium. Patients with a SPP less than 70 mm of mercury warrant emergency department thoracotomy EDT, with opening of the pericardium to address the injury. Thoracoscopy is not considered a reasonable treatment for traumatic chest wounds with hypotension. This patient does not warrant an earth thoracotomy because the systolic BP is greater than 70 mm of mercury. The best initial treatment is ultrasound guided placement of a pericardial catheter followed by transfer to the operating room for definite treatment. Which of the following is an indication for emergency department thoracotomy EDT, a witnessed cardiac arrest after a stab wound to the chest with 25 minutes of CPR? B. Witnessed cardiac arrest after blunt trauma to the chest with 10 minutes of CPR. C. Profound hypotension, systolic BP less than 70, following a stab wound to the chest. D. Cardiac arrest in the ED following closed head injury. The correct answer is C. The utility of EDT has been debated for many years. Current indications are based on 30 years of prospective data. EDT is associated with the highest survival rate after isolated cardiac injury. 35% of patients presenting in shock and 20% without vital signs, i.e., pulse or obtainable blood pressure, are resuscitated after isolated penetrating injury to the heart. For all penetrating wounds, survival rate is 15%. Conversely, patient outcome is poor when EDT is done for blunt trauma, with 2% survival among patients in shock and less than 1% survival among those with no vital signs. A is incorrect because there was more than 15 minutes of CPR following a penetrating injury. B is incorrect because there was more than 5 minutes of CPR following a blunt injury. D is incorrect. There is no indication for EDT after isolated head injury. Management of suspected blunt cardiac injury includes which of the following? A mandatory admission to an intensive care unit. B. Cardiac catheterization. C. Continuous monitoring if EKG abnormalities are noted. D. Cardiac enzymes. The correct answer is C. Although as many as one-third of patients sustaining significant blunt chest trauma experience blunt cardiac injury, few such injuries result in hemodynamic embarrassment. Patients with electrocardiographic ECG, abnormalities or dysrhythmias require continuous ECG monitoring and antidysrhythmic treatment as needed. Unless myocardial infarction is suspected, there is no role for measurement of cardiac enzyme levels. They lack specificity and do not predict significant dysrhythmias. The patient with hemodynamic instability requires aggressive resuscitation and may benefit from the placement of a pulmonary artery catheter to optimize preload and guide inotropic support. Echocardiography may be indicated to exclude pericardial tamponade or valvular or septal injuries. It typically demonstrates right ventricular dyskinesia but is less helpful in titrating treatment and monitoring the response to therapy unless done repeatedly. Patients with refractory cardiogenic shock may require placement of an intraaortic balloon pump to decrease myocardial work and enhance coronary perfusion. Admission to an intensive care unit is determined by whether or not there is need for continuous monitoring and or any hemodynamic instability. It is not mandatory for all patients with blunt cardiac injury. Cardiac catheterization is not used in the diagnosis or treatment of blunt cardiac injury. Cardiac enzymes are not specific for blunt cardiac injury and do not help in the management of these patients. A patient presents with stable vital signs and respiratory distress after a stab wound to the chest. 
Chest tubes are placed and an air leak is noted. The patient is electively intubated. The patient arrests after positive pressure ventilation is started. What is the most likely diagnosis? A unrecognized hemorrhage in the abdomen. B. Tension pneumothorax. C. Pericardial tamponade D. Air embolism. The correct answer is D. Air embolism is a frequently overlooked or undiagnosed lethal complication of pulmonary injury. Air emboli can occur after blunt or penetrating trauma, when air from an injured bronchus enters an adjacent injured pulmonary vein, bronchovenous fistula, and returns air to the left heart. Air accumulation in the left ventricle impedes diastolic filling, and during systole air is pumped into the coronary arteries, disrupting coronary perfusion. The typical case is a patient with a penetrating thoracic injury who is hemodynamically stable but experiences arrest after being intubated and placed on positive pressure ventilation. The patient should immediately be placed in Trendelenburg's position to trap the air in the apex of the left ventricle. Emergency thoracotomy is followed by cross-clamping of the pulmonary hilum on the side of the injury to prevent further introduction of air figure 7 to 6. Air is aspirated from the apex of the left ventricle and the aortic root with an 18-gauge needle and 50 ml syringe. Vigorous massage is used to force the air bubbles through the coronary arteries. If this is unsuccessful, a tuberculin syringe may be used to aspirate air bubbles from the right coronary artery. Once circulation is restored, the patient should be kept in Trendelenburg's position with the pulmonary hilum clamped until the pulmonary venous injury is controlled operatively. Which of the following is the expected blood loss in a patient with six rib fractures? A 240 milliliters. B 480 milliliters. C 750 milliliters. D 1500 milliliters. The correct answer is C. For each rib fracture there is approximately 100 to 200 milliliters of blood loss. For tibial fractures, 300 to 500 milliliters. For femur fractures, 800 to 1000 milliliters. And for pelvic fractures, greater than 1000 milliliters. Although no single injury may appear to cause a patient's hemodynamic instability, the sum of the injuries may result in life-threatening blood loss. A 25-year-old man presents following blunt trauma to the abdomen. Fast exam shows injury to the spleen. His HR is 110, RR is 25 and he is mildly anxious. What percentage of his blood volume do you estimate he has lost? A less than 15%. B 15 minus 30%. C 30 minus 40%. D greater than 40%. The correct answer is B. He has class 2 hemorrhagic shock based on his vital signs, with a loss of between 15% and 30% of his blood volume. A 27-year-old man presents to the ED after receiving blows to the head. He opens his eyes with painful stimuli, is confused, and localizes to pain. What is his Glasgow coma score? A 13. B 11. C 9. D 7. The correct answer is B. His score is 2, I plus 4, verbal plus 5, motor equals 11. A 75-year-old woman presents to the ED following an MVA. She has decreased strength and sensation in her arms. She has normal strength and sensation in her legs. The most likely diagnosis is a brown secord syndrome, B anterior cord syndrome, C central cord syndrome, D posterior cord syndrome. The correct answer is C. There are several partial or incomplete spinal cord injury syndromes. Central cord syndrome usually occurs in older persons who experience hyperextension injuries. Motor function and pain and temperature sensation are preserved in the lower extremities but diminished in the upper extremities. Some functional recovery usually occurs but is often not a return to normal. Anterior cord syndrome is characterized by diminished motor function and pain and temperature sensation below the level of the injury, but position sensing, vibratory sensation, and crude touch are maintained. Prognosis for recovery is poor. Brown scored syndrome is usually the result of a penetrating injury in which the right or left half of the spinal cord is transected. This rare lesion is characterized by the ipsilateral loss of motor function, proprioception, and vibratory sensation, whereas pain and temperature sensation are lost on the contralateral side. Posterior cord syndrome does not exist. The appropriate treatment of an asymptomatic patient with a stab wound to zone 3 of the neck is a observation, BCT of the neck, C angiography, D operative exploration. The correct answer is A. 
Zone 3 is the superior portion of the neck, above the angle of the mandible. Asymptomatic patients can be observed. Zone 3 injuries that are symptomatic should be evaluated with angiography and, if necessary, embolization of bleeding vessels. Which of the following is an indication for CT of the chest to rule out a thoracic aortic injury? A left hemoneumothorax. B. Respiratory distress with multiple rib fractures. C. High-speed head-on MBC with normal chest radiograph. D. Left scapular pain. The correct answer is C. At least 7% of patients with a descending torn aorta have a normal chest radiograph. Therefore, screening spiral CT scanning is performed based on the mechanism of injury, high-energy deceleration motor vehicle collision with frontal or lateral impact, motor vehicle collision with ejection, falls of greater than 25 feet, or direct impact force kick to chest, snowmobile or ski collision with tree. The CXR finding of a left apical cap is suggestive of a thoracic aortic injury. Multiple rib fractures or scapular pain alone are not suggestive of a thoracic aortic injury. A 20-year-old young man presents with an left anterior 8th intercoastal space stab wound. He is in no distress and a chest X-ray is normal. A diagnostic peritoneal lavage is performed and has a RBC count of 8,000 per microliter and a WBC count of 300 per microliter. Which of the following is the best treatment for this patient? Observation only. BCT scan. C. Laparoscopy. D. Exploratory laparotomy. The correct answer is C. Occult injury to the diaphragm must be ruled out in patients with stab wounds to the lower chest. For patients undergoing DPL evaluation, laboratory value cutoffs are different for those with thoracoabdominal stab wounds and for those with standard anterior abdominal stab wounds. An RBC count of greater than 10,000 per microliter is considered a positive finding and an indication for laparotomy. Patients with a DPL RBC count between 1,000 per microliter and 10,000 per microliter should undergo laparoscopy or thoracoscopy. A 45-year-old, otherwise healthy woman presents after a moving vehicle accident. She is hemodynamically stable and with only minimal tenderness in her right upper quadrant. A fast exam, focused abdominal sonographic test, is positive with fluid seen in the hepatorenal fossa and the pelvis. Which of the following is the next best step in her management? A. Observation only. B. C. T. Scan. C. Laparoscopy. D. Exploratory laparotomy. The correct answer is B. Patients with fluid on fast examination, considered a positive fast, who do not have immediate indications for laparotomy and are hemodynamically stable undergo CT scanning to quantify their injuries. Injury grading using the American Association for the Surgery of Trauma Grading Scale is a key component of non-operative management of solid organ injuries. Because of the risk of a solid organ injury, observation is not indication. If she has an isolated liver or spleen injury, the correct treatment is most likely observation, therefore, both laparoscopy and laparotomy would not be indicated. After CT scan, she is shown to have a liver laceration. There is a 4 cm laceration into the right lobe with a 10 cm subcapsular hematoma. What grade liver injury does she have? A grade 1 B grade 2 C grade 3 D grade 4 The correct answer is C. Because she has a laceration greater than 3 cm in depth, she has a grade 3 liver injury. Which of the following is an indication for operative intervention in a patient with an isolated duodenal hematoma? A hematoma greater than 3 cm in diameter. B. Total or near total occlusion of the duodenum by the hematoma. C. Failure to resolve 10 days after admission. D. Contained retroperitoneal leak. The correct answer is D. The majority of duodenal hematomas are managed non-operatively with nasogastric suction and parenteral nutrition. Patients with suspected associated perforation, suggested by clinical deterioration or imaging with retroperitoneal free air or contrast extravasation, should undergo operative exploration. A marked drop in nasogastric tube output heralds resolution of the hematoma, which typically occurs within two weeks. Repeat imaging to confirm these clinical findings is optional. If the patient shows no clinical or radiographic improvement within three weeks, operative evaluation is warranted. The size of the hematoma is not a criterion for operative intervention, nor is the degree of initial occlusion by the hematoma. Patients with persistent duodenal occlusion after three weeks should undergo operative exploration. Any sign of perforation is an indication for exploration.
Which of the following is an indication for a lower leg fasciotomy? A greater than 35 mmHg difference in diastolic pressure and the compartment pressure. B greater than 35 mmHg difference in mean arterial pressure and the compartment pressure. C greater than 25 mm of mercury difference in systolic pressure and the compartment pressure. D greater than 25 mmHg compartment pressure, regardless of blood pressure. The correct answer is A. In conscious patients with compartment syndrome, pain is the prominent symptom, and active or passive motion of muscles in the involved compartment increases the pain. Paresthesias may also be described. In the lower extremity, numbness between the first and second toes is the hallmark of early compartment syndrome in the exquisitely sensitive anterior compartment and its enveloped deep perineal nerve. Progression to paralysis can occur, and loss of pulses is a late sign. In comatose or obtunded patients, the diagnosis is more difficult to secure. In patients with a compatible history and a tense extremity, compartment pressures should be measured with a handheld striker device. Fasciotomy is indicated in patients with a gradient of less than 35 mm of mercury gradient equals diastolic pressure, compartment pressure ischemic periods of greater than 6 hours, or combined arterial and venous injuries. In the absence of clinical signs such as pain and paresthesias, compartment pressures are used to determine the need for fasciotomy. The difference between the diastolic blood pressure and the compartment pressure is measured. Patients with a gradient greater than 35 mm of mercury should undergo a fasciotomy. Which of the following bladder pressures is an absolute indication for a decompressive laparotomy? A greater than 5 mm of mercury. B greater than 15 mm of mercury. C greater than 25 mm of mercury. D greater than 35 mm of mercury. The correct answer is D. Generally, no specific bladder pressure prompts therapeutic intervention, except when the pressure is greater than 35 mm of mercury. Rather, emergent decompression is carried out when intra-abdominal hypertension reaches a level at which end-organ dysfunction occurs. Mortality is directly affected by decompression, with 60% mortality in patients undergoing presumptive decompression, 70% mortality in patients with a delay in decompression, and nearly uniform mortality in those not undergoing decompression. Abdominal hypertension is classified by grade, with grade 1 mild being greater than 10 mm of mercury, is greater than or equal to 13 cm HO. Grade 4 hypertension or greater than 35 mm of mercury, is greater than or equal to 48 cm HO, is an absolute indication for decompressive laparotomy. Which of the following is a normal physiologic change during pregnancy? A relative anemia. B. Decrease in circulating blood volume. C. Respiratory acidosis. D. Bradycardia. The correct answer is, A. Pregnancy results in physiologic changes that may impact post-injury evaluation. Heart rate increases by 10 to 15 beats per minute during the first trimester and remains elevated until delivery. Blood pressure diminishes during the first two trimesters due to a decrease in systemic vascular resistance and rises again slightly during the third trimester. Mean values, first equals 105 60th, second equals 102 55th, third equals 108 67th. Intravascular volume is increased by up to 8 L, which results in a relative anemia but also a relative hypervolemia. Consequently, a pregnant woman may lose 35% of her blood volume before exhibiting signs of shock. Pregnant patients have an increase in tidal volume and minute ventilation but a decreased functional residual capacity. This results in a diminished PCO reading and respiratory alkalosis. Also, Pregnant patients may desaturate more rapidly, particularly in the supine position and during intubation. Supplemental oxygen is always warranted in the trauma patient but is particularly critical in the injured pregnant patient, because the oxygen dissociation curve is shifted to the left for the fetus compared to the mother. Small changes in maternal oxygenation result in larger changes for the fetus because the fetus is operating in the steep portions of the dissociation curve. As noted earlier there is a relative anemia during pregnancy, but a hemoglobin level of less than 11 grams per deciliter is considered abnormal. Additional hematologic changes include a moderate leukocytosis, up to 20,000 cubic millimeters, and a relative hypercoagulable state due to increased levels of factors 7, 8, IX, X, and 12 and decreased fibrinolytic activity. Excellent. You passed the exam. Thanks, doctor. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you in more next videos. With my best wishes, Dr. Atef Ahmed.